Thank you for joining this presentation on detecting cholera using a cholera dipstick. This is a presentation from the Dove Project, which stands for Delivering Oral Vaccine Effectively. It's based at Johns Hopkins University. I'm Dr. David Sack, the principal investigator of this project. The goal of this presentation is to help you become familiar with the use of the cholera dipstick so that you'll know when to use it and you will have the ability to actually carry out the test properly. Now, this presentation should be used along with the Stop Cholera Toolkit, which is available on our website. And specifically within the toolkit, there are two sections one called the cholera surveillance, and the other one called the manual for detecting verbial cholera. And the website is at www.stopcholera.org, and you can see the backslash toolkits, etc. First, addressing the reasons for wanting to detect cholera. I believe if you're watching this presentation, you probably already know that cholera is an acute diarrheal disease which can spread rapidly and can cause severe outbreaks and epidemics. And when cholera occurs, interventions need to be put in place quickly to eliminate deaths and prevent spread of the outbreak. And surveillance is very important to identify outbreaks quickly so that you can put in place the interventions. But there's additional reasons for carrying out cholera surveillance. I've already mentioned the surveillance to identify outbreaks quickly. But after an outbreak has already started, it's important to monitor the course of the outbreak so that you know the pace of this outbreak and know whether it's increasing or decreasing or at the end to document that the outbreak is over. When we see outbreaks, oftentimes there's cholera hotspots where most of the cases are occurring, and so it's important to understand where those hotspots are occurring. Many countries have cholera in an endemic manner, and for those countries, it's important to characterize the epidemiology, and to do this properly, you need a, a good surveillance system. When we think about interventions, we want to identify high-risk groups. There may be socioeconomic groups, cultural groups, geographic groups, to identify those groups, and, and that requires a surveillance system that is easily put in place. When we are wanting to document the effectiveness of cholera prevention programs, these operations research projects will require understanding and documenting the cholera cases that are being seen. And so again, we need to have a surveillance system in place. Since cholera can be a deadly disease, we want to especially know where cholera deaths are occurring so that these can be targeted for interventions. Now, the dipstick test that we will be talking about today is for clinical cases. You should be aware that you can use this test for environmental samples, that is, water samples, but we will not be dealing with that test in this presentation. One of the questions about using this dipstick test is, do we need to test all of the patients? How many patients should be tested? I'd like to clarify that this is a test which is mainly used for epidemiological purposes or for special purposes, but it's certainly not needed to test every patient who has a syndrome that might be cholera. So if you're considering using this test, first you need to establish a clinical case definition. And in general, I'd like to use this test with people who have a severe or moderately severe diarrheal illness. That is, Diarrhea is such a common complaint that brings people to a clinic. It's not necessary and not appropriate to use this test with every such patient. But if a patient has moderate or severe 
dehydration due to diarrhea, then this would be a potential patient for carrying out the test. Now, the number of samples to be tested will differ depending on the type of surveillance. That is, if you're experiencing a new outbreak, you want to document that outbreak by testing a good number of samples, perhaps 10 to 20, in order to know and document that this truly is a new outbreak. However, after the outbreak is underway, then it's more a matter of just confirming a representative sample of the specimens so you know what proportion of such patients actually have cholera. And I've shown some examples here that during an outbreak, only a representative sample of patients need to be tested. However, if you're monitoring the effectiveness of an intervention, such as a vaccine intervention or a water sanitation intervention, then you need to test a much larger sample, perhaps all of the patients, in order to reach the needed sample size. Now, typically, the way to confirm a patient as having cholera is to obtain a fecal specimen and send that specimen to the laboratory for culture. And this slide shows a typical appearance of Vibrio cholera plated onto a medium called TCBS auger. And this is still recommended to confirm cholera outbreaks. However, the dipstick method can supplement or even replace culture in many situations. So why do we need a dipstick test? Well, unfortunately, microbiology laboratories and trained technicians are often not available in areas where cholera occurs. I'm sure it's obvious to most of you that cholera occurs in remote areas of developing countries, and often these countries are relatively underdeveloped, so laboratories are just not available or feasible. Secondly, transporting specimens to the laboratory takes time and it takes patience. Thirdly, the dipstick test is less expensive than carrying a uh, culture. The microbiology test takes about two to three days once the specimen reaches the laboratory, but in reality, it often takes one to two weeks from the time the specimen is obtained until the results are returned to the hospital. Obviously, one to two weeks is way too long to be very useful. And for cholera, this is a disease which moves quickly, can be fatal quickly, and outbreaks can progress very rapidly. So it's important that such an outbreak be confirmed rapidly. So what is this dipstick test? I call it a same-day test. I don't say rapid test because rapid test usually implies that a result would be obtained within just a few minutes. I say same-day test because the test result can be obtained within the same day that the specimen is obtained. It works in a very similar manner to a pregnancy test. It's a test strip which is designed to detect the lipopolysaccharide of the Vibrio cholera bacterium from a fecal specimen. So it does provide the results the same day the sample was collected. It uses a monoclonal antibody, which is specific for the Vibrio cholera O1 LPS. I should mention that it has two lines. One is for the serotype O1, the other for the O139, but I'll mention the O139 a bit later. The test was originally designed to be used directly with a fecal sample. However, we found that if we enrich the specimen in alkaline peptone water for six hours, that we have a more reliable result. So the reasons for this enriched dipstick test, the problem with the direct test is that this does yield a fair number of false positive tests. That means that the test is not as specific as is desired. Also, 
If we use a direct test, this is not suitable if we're obtaining a rectal swab specimen as opposed to a stool specimen. Rectal swab just does not provide a sufficient sample to be tested directly. Most importantly, if we enrich the specimen in alkaline peptone water, we get essentially no false positives. And so we can have much more confidence that a positive test is in fact a true positive and not a false positive. Now we should note that this dipstick has two lines on it. One is for the O1, the other is for the O139 serotype. It turns out that the O139 is the line that gives many of the false positives when the test is used directly with the stool sample. So I think the best advice for now is to disregard the results from the O139 line unless you should have the outbreak with the serotype O139. And we just have not seen this for many, many years. So far, we've never had an O139 outbreak in Africa. And in Asia, we only see a very sporadic case of O139. So the best advice is just don't even pay attention to the O139 line. Now, what will you need to carry out the test? Well, if you are in a hospital or a health center where you would be carrying out this test, you'll need what I would call a laboratory corner if you don't have a proper laboratory. Obviously, if you have a laboratory, then you should send the specimen to the lab and you can carry out the test there. But if all you have is a table that you can set aside in a designated area, this can be done in a very simple space. This does not require a trained laboratory technician, but it does require a person who has been trained in the use of the test. This might be a nurse. It might be another person who is intelligent and can follow the instructions for doing the test. So obviously the patient will be providing a fecal specimen or potentially a rectal swab. The specimens need to be labeled with a patient identification label. There should be some sterile cotton-tipped swabs. These will be used to inoculate the fecal specimen into the alkaline peptone water. You should have some tube racks to hold the tubes of alkaline peptone water. You'll need to have tubes with the APW. These would need to be provided by a central laboratory. Of course, you'll need the dipstick test. The test that we're using in this presentation is called the Crystal VC dipstick test. If you choose to send specimens on to a reference laboratory for culture, you should have Carrie Blair transport medium. Alternatively, it is possible to send specimens on a filter paper, and we'll talk about that later. It's best if you be using disposable latex gloves. Keep in mind that these are biohazardous specimens, and so you should be protecting yourself, and of course, afterwards, you should be disposing of the gloves safely and washing your hands after the procedures are done. This will require biohazard bags, and after the test, you should disinfect the tubes and any other materials that might have become contaminated. These illustrate just the components of the test. You'll see in the pictures that we have the components there where the kit is shown with the dipstick, the tube, and some buffer solution. We'll be illustrating how we do this, that we inoculate the specimen in alkaline peptone water. Then the alkaline peptone water is incubated for about six hours. We say a range of five to 18 hours since it depends on the time of day that the specimen is received. If it's received at the end of the day, it's okay to let this incubate overnight. After the incubation period, you then place 
four drops from the alkaline peptone water into the test tube. And this test tube is provided with the kit. You would then insert the dipstick into the test tube. You would then observe for the development of a line. If the specimen is positive, this line should be visible within a few minutes. If the line is not seen within 15 minutes, then the test is negative. So any line that develops after 15 minutes is not included in your result. Now you'll see that a control line will show up, and this indicates that the test was valid. If you do not see the control line, then the test is not valid, and you would have to repeat the test with another dipstick. Of course, you'd record the results of the test. Now, there is another way you can confirm the results of this test using the culture or a PCR. Recall that if you do the dipstick test, this gives you a lot of information about whether that specimen contained Vibrio cholera or not. However, a culture is needed if you're going to do antibiotic sensitivity testing so that you would send a certain number of specimens to the laboratory for culture so that sensitivity testing can be carried out. It's sometimes important to also save specimens so that a PCR test could be carried out to confirm the results of the dipstick. Now, unfortunately, the PCR testing, this kind of testing is only carried out in a few research laboratories, so it's not something that you would do routinely, but it can be done if there's any question about the results of the dipstick test. This slide illustrates how you would save samples for DNA testing using PCR. You'll note that the stool sample can be placed onto filter paper and then air dried before placing into a plastic bag. Now you'll see that the filter paper that we recommend has a space for five different specimens, but Specimens can easily contaminate each other, can bleed from one sample to another, so it's necessary to cut these filter papers so that they are completely separate and not able to contaminate from specimen to specimen. This slide illustrates placing a fecal sample directly onto the filter paper, and that's possible, but you can also inoculate the filter paper from the alkaline peptone water by putting two drops onto a filter paper, letting that air dry, and then putting that into the plastic bag. Now these filter paper samples can be saved for weeks or months or even up to a year or more. The DNA is quite stable, and these can be then tested to uh, confirm the results of the dipstick in case there's any question about its reliability. I hope you've seen that it is a fairly simple test and that you should be able to actually do this test by yourself now. Please do use this presentation along with the manual that's found on the website. If there's any questions, we would be happy to hear from you and uh, help you with any issues or problems that you might have. Thank you very much.